As a profession, wildland firefighting can be as hazardous and dynamic as the fire itself. Public and firefighter safety are always the agency's highest priorities. Because of safety concerns, agency administrators and fire management officials are often faced with difficult decisions about which strategies to choose in managing wildfires. On August 28th, a series of thunderstorms crossed the high cascades, igniting dozens of small fires. The Shadow Lake fire was reported at about 2.30 p.m. by the Black Butte Lookout. It began as a single tree strike in a late successional Douglas fir forest on the eastern slopes of Mount Washington in the Deschutes National Forest. It was reported at that time to be about 10 acres and spotting actively to the east. A call late about five minutes later said it was reporting to be about 15 to 20 acres and still actively spotting to the east. Our initial actions were to go out and size it up and begin to prepare old roads and dozer lines to the east of the fire to keep it from spreading east onto private lands and developed lands. Located approximately 15 miles northwest of Sisters, Oregon, the fire quickly grew to 300 acres in a single day. Burning near the boundary of the Deschutes and Willamette National Forests, agency administrators from both sides of the crest came together to weigh several important decision-guiding factors, including probability of success, safety, and values at risk. As the deciding official, Anthony knew a timely decision was needed about how to approach the fire. The area this fire was in was pre-identified before the fire as an area of high risk due to, due to the load, high fuel loadings in it, the possibility of large fires, and also the high exposure to firefighters from dead trees. There are places where 60 to 80 percent of the forest is dead, so it's got high exposure to snags uh, falling on firefighters. There's no easy access into this area, there's no trails, there's no roads, there's, there's no escape routes, there's no safety zones. Hand crews would have to build all that underground as they're trying to contain a fire more directly. That is a situation that smacks of no success and high exposure to firefighter safety, and that's really the basis for making our decision. Given the conditions on the ground, Meg Mitchell, forest supervisor for the Willamette National Forest, agreed with the strategy. I knew a little bit about the conditions that we were facing in this forest. It's got lots of, it has lots of snags, so lots of dead and down, and when I say lots of snags, I mean that every third tree has a spike top or is dead. In some places you have 80 percent uh, mortality. Despite the likely impacts to the public and businesses in his county, Deschutes County Forester Joe Stutler says he knew the area needed to burn. When I look at the, the uh, the wilderness areas that surround Deschutes County to the west. Uh, most of that stuff's out of whack. You know, it, it's been infested with uh, multiple uh, disease events, uh, either insect or, or some other type of thing affected by drought, and, and frankly, most of that stuff is, you know, really needs some fire. Operations Section Chief Mike Matarisi said it was a matter of weighing the risks. And what we had to look at was either a short-term fire scenario, which was really high exposure, high risk to the firefighter, or the other option was let's have a longer fire, which decreases exposure to the firefighter, but has greater impacts over a longer term to the public. We decided to go with the less exposure to the firefighter. Mitchell also agreed that safety was the priority, so the decision was easy. That sounded kind of like a no-brainer to me in terms of putting people out there in a direct way. It was a much better strategy to let the fire come to us on our terms. Early on, support from cooperating agencies for the use of both indirect and direct tactics was recognized as an essential piece in successfully implementing the strategy and maintaining long-term relationships. And one of the things that went really well with this decision-making process is that we had that horizontal discussion with our key cooperators, the Oregon Department of Forestry, the Deschutes County Forester, some of the uh, fire chiefs from the local fire protection districts, and we had that alignment on this strategy. Everybody agreed that going indirect with point protection was going to have the highest likelihood of success of protecting the values at risk outside the wilderness and have the, thus the least exposure to firefighter safety. The good existing relationships and communication among neighboring forests, cooperating agencies, and stakeholders proved to be a valuable asset. Deschutes County Forester Joe Stutler says he supported the strategy, despite the fact that reduced risk to firefighters meant more risk for cooperators like Deschutes County. I never 
felt threatened by the risk uh, to the you know to the county to uh, or to the community because frankly with the previous burn scars I was pretty sure if it emerged east uh, or to the south it was going to in fact get into fuels that we had you know a high you know you know level of success of stopping my my biggest concern was uh, putting you know, 2,000 firefighters in a country that hadn't burned for 200 years and then having to deal with the consequences of that. So we felt pretty good about uh, the, the risk uh, from the standpoint of it coming out and, for example, burning down Blackbeat Ranch or those types of things uh, because we were uh, pretty sure that once it hit the previous burns, it was going to go down. A combination of indirect tactics to confine the fire mostly to the wilderness and direct tactics to protect recreation values near the wilderness boundary became the marching orders for the Portland National Incident Management Organization, or NEMO team, that was brought in to manage the fire. Long-term analysts predicted the fire had a relatively small chance of reaching the crest over the next few days, but 10 days of unprecedented low humidities and record-breaking energy release components, along with the fire that was being carried primarily through fast-burning lichen, meant the fire experienced sustained growth for more days than anyone predicted. I remember sitting in the briefing as the fire was cresting the hill. So this fire was moving about 24 to 36 hours ahead of predicted weather and predicted fire behavior. It was on September 3rd that warm, dry, easterly winds pushed the fire west toward the Big Lake Recreation Area, prompting the orderly evacuation of a youth camp, developed and dispersed camping sites, and several cabins under special use permits. Primarily, we had plenty of time to do that evacuation well. We had anticipation based on the long-term assessment, and we had advanced cooperation with our partners, which were the Sheriff Department of several counties, that really helped us a lot get people out safely and slowly. As identified in the strategy and supported by the cooperating agencies, firefighters used direct tactics to provide point protection around the structures at Big Lake. Extensive firing operations that spanned 1,300 acres were conducted around the lake and along the 960 road to reduce some of the hazardous fuels between the structures and the active fire front. During this time of active fire behavior, the fire also spotted outside of the wilderness, across the historic Sandium Wagon Road, and on to the western slopes of the Cache Mountains. It was here that fire management officials decided to conduct a series of firing operations, shown here in black, to reduce the ability of the fire to make large runs toward U.S. Highway 20 and popular recreation sites around Suttle Lake. Scarred landscapes from previous fires, including the 2002 Cache Mountain Fire, 2003 B&B &B Complex, and the 2007 GW Fire, provided some buffer against fire spread to the north, east, and south. To the west, the fire pushed within two and a half miles of U.S. Highway 126 and the Mackenzie River Corridor, where it was corralled by exposed lava fields and a combination of handline and dozer line, shown here in brown. As the fire advanced, the values at risk and the communities that needed information changed. All agencies involved realized that the decision to use indirect tactics meant that there would be prolonged consequences related to recreation and local businesses as well as impacts to public health due to smoke. Um, the Willamette has both urban audiences and rural audiences and those are very different and they're very different between the two forests, the Deschutes and the and the Willamette. Uh, so there was smoke it concerns, especially in the urban areas, um, and understanding how smoke moves in the landscape and that sometimes that's about wind and factors that are independent of the fire, and sometimes it's related to the fire. It kept trading sides of the hill, so to speak, on the crest, and it, it, you'd get some excitement generated from the smoke. And that also affected traffic. Um, there were traffic concerns. We had a major holiday weekend that was uh, bi very busy, a Ducks game, you know, it just went on and on. And this is one of the busiest corridors in the Willamette National Forest for recreation. So constantly paying attention and trying to think ahead about what people were going to be concerned about, not just in the local rural area, 
uh, where fire is mainly the concern, but also in your urban areas where smoke is the concern. Throughout the fire, the importance of providing visitors and local residents with ample information about the fire and expected smoke impacts was paramount. Uh, let them understand what you're thinking, why you're making the decisions, and how you understand the implications of those decisions. Just keep them informed. That helps them um, you know, be less scared and be maybe less angry with some of the decisions that are being made. One of the most important topics that was addressed through fire updates, community meetings, and personal contacts was the benefits of fire as part of the forest cycle. I think when this uh, dramatic fire uh, starts to come to an end and the public gets to understand that the wilderness has now been renewed with, with fire and that forest is going to start over with a brand new forest and that the important things to our community have been protected you know, the private lands and the, uh, and the, and the resort lands to the east, the, the important recreational lands to the west and to the northwest, that all those have been protected and the, for, the fire has renewed the forest in, in the wilderness, I think the public will understand that there was some benefit to this strategy. Mitchell also saw the opportunities the fire provided to talk with members of the public about the benefits of fire on the landscape. I had a gentleman call me very upset about uh, us letting the fire burn. And um, what I told him is that sometimes you have a fire and you have a forest uh, that needs to be reborn. And we're not letting it burn, we're letting it be reborn. And uh, in this case you had a dying forest that in some parts um, the fire was doing some good. And long term we've reduced the risk in the Big Lake area. We have had concerns for decades about the Big Lake area and uh, how vulnerable it was to a forest fire. There were also benefits unrelated to the ecosystem, but important to firefighter safety in the future. The benefits of this fire are not just for the ecosystem. Uh, in the short term, sure, we had high firefighter exposure for a limited amount of time. But over a longer time period, because this area has burned, we won't have to send firefighters in there again. So long term, you decrease the amount of firefighter exposure in these type areas. The decision to use a flexible strategy based on minimizing firefighter exposure and promoting forest health helped set the stage for the fire to achieve its natural and human-driven objectives. As with any wildfire, the Shadow Lake Fire provided a valuable opportunity for lessons learned in managing public expectations and working with all agencies and cooperators ahead of time when possible to avoid delays in gathering much needed decision-making data. If there was anything I could do different, it would be to preload that information of the values at risk into our GIS system so we can pull it up much more readily. And the other thing would be to draw the box a little bigger in terms of um, the kind of values at risk that you look at initially because it's likely to be important later as the fire grows, as it moves in the landscape. Ultimately, cooperation was the key to implementing a strategy that outwardly appeared to have negative impacts and yet resulted in long-term success for the forest and the safety of firefighters and the public. Looking ahead and working out future strategies and fire issues that cross forest boundaries, such as closures, temporary flight restrictions, and smoke, helps ensure smoother and more efficient interactions the next time a fire knocks on the door. When it finally arrives, there are a lot of relationships to juggle and little time to build them from scratch. We were responding to a lot of different demands. Uh, operations was actually responding to the fire. Uh, we were also needing to look ahead at several operational periods. We were trying to load, get the values at risk understood, get alignment in the decisions, alignment with communication, get closures in place, get relationships in place. Early coordination and alignment can ease much of a line officer's stress when making these kinds of risk-based decisions. It was good and important. Uh, it helped me make that decision more comfortably by having that alignment. So that's something that I would uh, recommend uh, to other line officers who are faced with the decision is have that discussion up front and get that alignment as much as possible. Wildfire management strategies that seek to protect public and firefighter safety and improve the condition of our forests require the willingness of fire managers and acceptance by the public to use a variety of firefighting tactics, including indirect tactics that can result in longer duration fires and greater economic and political impacts. 
for Bill Anthony and Meg Mitchell, the results of the strategy selected to manage the Shadow Lake fire affirmed that given the factors facing them, they had made the right choice. I would do this decision again overall. It's always the best decision when you have the public and firefighter safety at risk the way we did in this fire to choose their safety over anything. And um, you know, we always, I always question at night, particularly run the tape back in my head about all the things that, did I make that right decision, all those little, little decisions that come overall, I would do it again. Stutler says he would also do the same thing, but each time it's different. It's situational. You have to think about, okay, you know, what are my chances of succeeding? Uh, what time of the year is it? How long we've we been in drought? How long has it been wet? Uh, what's the availability of the right type of incident management team that can, in fact, deal with the fire they have, but can think far enough ahead to mobilize the necessary resources to implement a, a you know long-term strategy? So it's not a, you can't generalize what you'll do. Uh, you may have the best intentions, but if you don't have the resources uh, or the, in some cases the weather or fuels to carry it out, hmm. you, can't, uh, you can't just say I'm going to do this. Anthony shared the same conclusion. You know, I thought about this decision uh, many times over the last couple of weeks during this fire. Um, of course, I've had the benefit of gathering additional information from other experienced firefighters and seeing exactly what the fire was going to do. And I feel a stronger and stronger conviction every day that I would make that same decision again, that we would have not been successful to go directly into the wilderness to fight this fire. And, um, and we would have had a high degree of exposure to firefighters. When a wildfire occurs, line officers and fire managers will find themselves dealing with basic questions like how should we engage this fire? While the question seems basic, the answers are best based on a foundation of exposure and risk management. It's hard for the human mind to accept that there are rarely hard and fast rules that can be assigned to fire behavior. The human thought process wants to create a logical, predictable structure. This is what makes engagement of a fire on the landscape a very complex issue. Even knowing the complexity and the fact that the unknowns often outweigh the knowns, fires are often engaged based on the belief that the final outcome is predictable. While the indirect tactics chosen on the Shadow Lake fire are not new, and fire managers have been using them both inside and outside wilderness areas for a long time, this fire's unpredictability challenged the thought processes of many, if not all, of the decision makers involved. Utilizing the risk management process of weighing the benefits against the exposure cost resulted in a successful outcome for managers, responders, and the public.